Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you are. It's back to Attrition and Beyond the Beach Week here on World War II TV and the events we are talking about were happening 77 years ago today. And we win from the Canadian sector. Yes, the, the American sector again. We are at a road intersection, kind of halfway between Utah Beach and Carrington. And um, we're going to leap straight in because poor old Mag doing the camera work is both doing camera and driving today. She hasn't got a dedicated driver. So Mag is on site with her camera. Hello, uh, hello, Mag. Hello, everybody. And we have Niels joining us from the Netherlands, who has been doing some incredible work into the German formations in Normandy and also, in turn, what the 101st Airborne and, in this case, the 70th Tank Battalion were involved in. So, good evening, Niels. Good evening. So, Looking forward to talking about this. Yeah, it, because every, it's one of those, there's some conversations around the sidebar. Everyone thinks they know this one. And actually, there's a little bit of inter detail that we're kind of presenting that is, 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 not quite the conventional way of looking at it but we want to be clear to people where we are and what we're doing so we've got a whole lot of images and aerial photos to show then we'll bring mag in so we are um going to be talking about this area here here's a wartime maps courtesy of Niels, and we are talking about this intersection of roads on the old n13 highway that ran to Cherbourg. now uh, and then karen and rent the road ran right through the middle of carrington now what confuses the heck out of things these days is the modern N13 highway bypasses the old N13 highway. So the new road kind of comes in over here. So when we're talking about intersections and junctions, the way the roads are laid out today is not exactly how the roads were laid out 77 years ago. So Niels and I and Mag will do our best to try and orient you at every point about where we are and which way we're facing. We've got various maps and things. So here is a f couple of photos, and I'll let Niels talk. This is Dead Man's Corner Junction, post-war, 60s sometime. And the, this is the old N13 highway with this road coming in from the side, joining it as a T. And another photo from just afterwards. So here's the road coming in. This is the main road. When we see it today on a map, I'll get to an aerial photo for you. You can see that the, this, is no, this is no longer the main road. This is now the main road coming down here where it joins the N13. You'll, it'll all bit make sense to you later on, folks. So um, I'm just explaining where we are. So um, we're going to go back and start talking about the 70th Tank Battalion. And um, I will hand over to Niels for this to explain their story. So while, while we're, we're, um, Niels is talking, I'll be using some of Mag's camera work as well. So who are the 70th Tank Battalion and what have they been doing since, since D-Day until June the 8th, Niels? Uh, well, the, the 70th Tank Battalion is basically the experienced tank battalion in the European theater at this particular time. We also have the second armored division, which had seen ac previous action. Uh, the 70th tank battalion had been in North Africa. It had been in Sicily and it was brought back uh, to, or it was brought to Europe uh, for, for uh, to, in, to support the invasion, basically. Uh, it consisted of four co companies, uh, line companies, two, uh, three with medium tanks, which means Shermans. Uh, two of those landed with, uh, with DD tanks. Uh, C Company landed with uh, regular Shermans with uh, deep wading equipment, and then you had the light tank company, uh, D Company, which you can see here, uh, which was uh, equipped with M5A1 uh, Stuart tanks armed with a 37 millimeter gun. And this is the unit which lost its tank, one of its tanks, at Dead Man's Corner. And they are. Uh, it's an iconic photo, the destroyed tank being inspected by uh, 101st Airborne uh, officers. But the story about what really what happened is, of course, complicated. Uh, this very iconic photo we see here. And like so many of the uh, well-known stories in from Normandy and from any war, basically, the story gets told and retold. And at some point, facts get changed or interpretations start to differ. So. What seems like a very uh, straightforward story, tank uh, entered uh, the crossroads uh, junction, basically, uh, was hit by something, commander was killed, hanging out of the tank, uh, stayed there for several days. That's the basic story as it's uh, being told today. Yeah. And it's more complicated for a lot of reasons than that. Yeah. So I'll just show people, folks, where we, where, where Mag is and where we're going to be. So here is the corner. We're not there yet. At the moment, Mag is up here. Mag is where the mouse is here. And Mag is um, just off the, here in the corner 
is the, is the new N13 highway. So now, now if you're driving from Caen to Cherbourg, you come up here and you don't go anywhere near um, the, the old road there. But at the time, um, you can uh, um, you would have been coming down this main road over here, okay? So um, that's what we're doing. Uh, so Maggie's here filming around here, and we're going to be talking about this journey coming down here. So I'm going to just put it on Mag's camera for a second, and we'll see this junction where we are now. And um, so, Mag, um, beautiful weather today. Yes, the sky is all blue. It's absolutely brilliant. Yeah, and um, it's it's the, this. So you're looking there, Mag, because um, you can see the road signs over there to your left. That is the slipway, the roads onto the new N13 highway. And if you spin the camera around to face behind you towards Carenton, perfect. There's the road down to Carenton. So I'll show people where we are again. So Mag is facing down this road here. So she's around here and she's going to be driving around here and up here and coming back. And we're just taking you around this whole action here because it's much more complicated than we thought it was. So um, th that's just what we're doing there. So that's Mag's image there. So um, we are talking about this tank unit. And if, if you haven't already, folks, please go back and watch the Vierville show that we premiered yesterday morning about these same units coming through Vierville, which is about two miles away from where we are now. That's closer to Utah Beach. And that will explain that Joe Machia was a guest on that, all about the 506 and the 70th Tank Battalion getting stuck in a problematic little village of Vierville. But this is the next day. This is June the 8th now. So, um, Niels, so as you said, this is a story that's been written ab about in a particular way. Um, but we're going to kind of address these stories and talk about what we, we what people like yourself and Robert's Armory in the States have been working out over the last few, few, um, few years. So, um, right. June the 8th, um, talk, tell us who, what, what, the, what the 70th were doing. Well, we're actually, uh, these events are happening late on the 7th, uh, transferring into the, into the 8th. This is, a lot of this is going on while the fighting at, uh, at Vierville that uh, Joe talked about yesterday was going on. Yeah. So while that's going on there, uh, elements of uh, the famous 2nd Battalion of the 506th, they're fighting at Vierville, they're heading to Angoville au Plain, as Paul knows better than anyone else. Uh, and at the same time, 1st Battalion is heading towards uh, Saint-Combe-du-Mont, or especially the high ground south of Saint-Combe-du-Mont. And that's an important area uh, for several reasons. But the most importantly, there's two main roads. Yeah, you can see it here. Uh, as you can, the, you can see, the Saint-Combe-du-Mont Saint is the village in uh, the top center. And then if you go south, you have Dead Man's Corner. Of what became that men's corner and the thing is the straight road running here is the n13 highway the main highway running through uh, this part of the peninsula all the way to cherbourg basically it's this is the highway running from from uh, paris all the way to cherbourg so this is a key road but at the junction you get another very important road and that's that one and that's the road going directly to utah beach so any German counterattack from the south needs those roads. And if you want to stop that, being the Allies and the Americans, you want to have that road junction. Because south of that road junction, it's, it's a causeway, basically. It's open terrain through marshes. Became famous, of course, for the for as Hell's Highway later on, uh, when other elements of the 101st Airborne pushed their way across the rivers uh, to, a, to attack Carantan. So this is a very important location. It's high ground. You can see there, folks, there's Vierville from yesterday's show. So Utah Beach, you carry on up that road, you end up at Utah Beach. Here's the road Niels is talking about coming in that goes into Carenton and then from Carenton to out the other side. Because essentially what we should point out is Carenton is going to be the town that links the Utah Beach sector and the Omaha Beach sector. Seventh Corps on Utah Beach, Fifth Corps on Omaha to link them into a combined front it has to be through Carenton and then further down to the to, towards um, Omaha is in Issa Mer. So coming in this direction there is vital. This road junction there becomes really important. So we've also talked about talk about the Germans who are in the air as well, which I know is your particular forte, Neil. So the Americans need it to link up the town. Why are the what? Where are the Germans involved? How are they defending this? Uh, well, the the Germans are organised in several different ways in this particular area. 
the, the beach itself is defended by the 709th Infantry Division, static division, uh, not, not, not mobile at all, basically. And to the rear, uh, covering the highway, in essence, you have the elements of the 91st Air Landing Division. One of its battalions is stationed, has its HQ, at saint tom du mont So they are present. They're defending the high ground. They, that's their tactic. We hold the high ground. Enemy will let probably land open fields, and we, we, we deal with them. But we hold the high ground, that, which is vital. Uh, this particular battalion, a uh, third battalion of that regiment, uh, was not responsible for basically the entire area from Carantan uh, all the way to the road which leads from uh, saint marie du mont to Chef du Pont. I'll just put this one in here as well, Niels, because that shows us the flooded area. The, the, now, the orientation is slightly differently because the road is now running across there. You can see that the date at the bottom, uh, 18th of May, 1944. So, yeah. so there's saint de Here's the road coming in from Utah Beach. Here's the corner we're talking about. And you can see here this inundated, flooded area. And you can see the high ground Niels is talking about is saint de And if you, don't wanna, if you don't understand... French, saint comme du mont du mont means on the mount, on the bit of high ground, like saint marie du mont And probably for about 10 miles in any direction, the church in saint comme du mont is probably the highest bit of ground, certainly for at least five miles in any direction, maybe 10. So the Germans know this is important ground to hold, but at, on D-Day, they only have one battalion in this particular area. To the south and southwest, there is a far stronger for my uh, unit, the 6th Falschenjäger Regiment. And they spent most of the D-Day morning uh, and night uh, dealing with the air landings. Uh, and then they, as it gets dawn, they realize on, on D-Day, this is not the, the main landings are not here, they're somewhere else. So they try to mop up as much as possible. And von der Heide uh, in the early afternoon basically moves uh, towards saint tom du mont uh, with two, uh, with 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 his staff and especially two battalion commanders, they climb the church. They look at the situation, and then they decide uh, what are we going to do about this. And von der Heide basically decides on sending two of his battalions, uh, first and second battalion, towards the coast. Uh, he has been ordered basically at uh, eight eight uh, eight o'clock in the morning already by uh, 80, 84th Army Corps, which is responsible for Normandy to attack. He's apparently not in con uh, contact at this particular time with, it, with the division he was subordinated to, the 91st. Uh, but he gets orders directly from, uh, from, from the Corps. And they say, you need to go towards the coast, uh, clear up, uh, free the 709, which is defending the coast, uh, get, get the enemy off their back, uh, clear their right flank, so we can uh, get control of the situation. So that's basically what he's been instructed to do and how he uh, decides to, to send his troops. Uh, his third battalion is still cleaning up in, uh, in, in Carantan uh, area, so that, that, that battalion is not involved. But he orders the other two battalions to move basically uh, northwest toward, or northeast towards the coast. His fir first battalion he sends with the objective of taking uh, the northern edge of uh, saint marie du mont And the second battalion he sends uh, out to take the northern edge of uh, Eastfield, which is a focal point of the 101st Airborne Division. So I know there's been a lot of, uh, been written about the battalion, second battalion being sent towards uh, saint marie du mont or saint uh, mary de uh, but that's not true if you read uh, the after action report, which uh, Greg Way, who has also been on your show, uh, is kindly provided to me. So, and also it makes much more sense because they can sort of support each other. They still have, there's still quite some distance between the battalions, but they're relatively close to, to one another. So they're moving towards the coast and they get some artillery support from the 82nd of uh, 91st Air Landing Division, which has artillery as already subordinated to the Falschimierke Division, or Falschimierke Regiment, uh, and also, uh, a battery that was in position to support uh, the, their own battalion, which had been at saint comte du mont So that's basically what's going on. Uh, they leave, uh, basically, and early in the evening, they start start that particular move. And as it gets dark, uh, there's also a glider landing, so it becomes rather confusing. 
And as we've seen yesterday, um, the first battalion gets basically stuck uh, before Saint Marie du Mont. They realize it's it's problematic there, so they form a hedgehog position and will deal with it when the day comes. And that's their mis and that's basically their mistake uh, because they don't have uh, their flank secured. The, the it's possible for the first uh, battalion of the 506 to get to Vierville, which is right to, to their rear. Uh, they slip through, basically, uh, and by the time the Falchimier realize they're going to have to withdraw, it's too late because because the, the second battalion of the 506 is moving through Vierville and there is a massive clash, as, as we have seen yesterday. And this basically means the end of the uh, first battalion of the Falchimier regiment. Some of the troops are forced towards the river, open country, they're picked off, they don't stand a chance, basically, and and uh, almost the entire bat uh, battalion is wiped out. Yeah. Only only a few dozen men make it back to German lines. So this is how they, an elite German unit basically loses one of its battalions on the second day of the invasion. And this has a lot of repercussions for what's happened in the, the rest of the seventh. Uh, in particularly, because once they realize there's a problem, they need to redeploy uh, second battalion because the flanks are uh, no longer protected at all. So they try to form a line from basically Heesfield uh, to La Drouerie uh, facing east to deal with any uh, enemy advance. So during this day, this particular uh, German battalion is first having to pull back and trying to establish itself. It's not already dug in. The only troops that are sort of dug in is a uh, third battalion of the of the Lufthansa division, uh, which is facing uh, has basically built rear guard positions uh, to protect uh, the, the rear of the of the two Falschenjäger battalions. But they're basically the only ones uh, in uh, who have already established positions. Um, and there's of course also the issue that. Uh, there's, or, there's still uh, strong, fairly strong American forces in the Bas Adeville area, uh, which also needs to be dealt with. And this is where uh, this regular German battalion is putting a lot of effort uh, in. And in that particular sense, the the road between uh, what becomes that man's corner and Utah Beach is sort of the, the boundary between that particular uh, army battalion on the right, the southeast, and some false uh, elements towards the uh, north northwest. And then this is a good time, Neil, to jump in and explain where Mag is because Mag is now because Mag has to do her own driving tonight. So Mag has moved down and she is now, now these are old aerial photos, well, old 10 years ago, taken by Marty Morgan, who's been on World War II TV shows before, author of numerous books, TV historian. And Mag is about here now. So on this road coming in from Utah Beach, and I really want to point out. As Neil said there, the high ground that, that we're talking about, because as you drop off down uh, down this road towards Carenton, you get to the floodplain. But where Mag is, it's really quite high. So if, if I put on Mag's camera again there, if you can swing up to the field behind you, Mag, and show that bit behind the museum. You can see the ground really does rise up there. So basically, if at that point, direction there, Mag is facing San Comodomon. You can see the ground rising up left to right. And that there, folks, is the D-Day experience, the museum. Uh, that there's a link to the to the museum's website in the description below, folks. If you haven't been to that museum yet in Normandy, it's a must-see. It's got a C-47 inside, a simulator, loads of uniforms and gear and equipment and vehicles. And, you know, we're talking about the actions outside. But you can see that high ground over there that's that's facing kind of – she's now facing pretty much due north. You can really see it clearly there. So, again, to show you where she is, folks, she's just about just about here. But there's now a new parking lot for the museum there. And uh, so, yeah, so I just wanted to explain the ground there to you. And Mag's going to move on to her next location very shortly. But we want to, while she's there, I know we have to jump through the timeline a bit on this because Mag can only be in one place at one time because we want to talk. We will come back to Germans in a minute, Neil. I want to talk about this, this arrival of the 70th Tampa Town down this road. I know I'm kind of rushing you now, but because Mag is there. So, so um, I'll bring up your map, Niels. And if you can start talking about this, and we'll come back to the Germans in a minute. Uh, so this is basically uh, we're just what, what you're seeing is two two little maps. 
uh, this is what we believe uh, where Don Burgett was, uh, where the tanks uh, arrived and, and what happened to it. On the left, you can basically see Don Burgett in that particular field max looking toward, uh, he, he was far ahead of his own troops uh, with a very small group, uh, slugging it out with Germans on the other side of the, of the, of the highway. And at some point there is a allied, uh, of an American tank, uh, light tank coming to their aid. Uh, which we believe came off this particular road between uh, Denman's Corner and uh, and Utah Beach, only had to turn through an opening and started to uh, engage. And this is important to, to remember because in Don Burgett's, how he describes it, it would appear that this is the tank destroyed at Denman's Corner. And there's a lot of reasons to say that's not possible uh, and that something else must have happened. Uh, it's clearly possible. I mean, the, the terrain is there. Uh, he describes it very well. And so far, people sort of, because Don Burgett describes how the tank exits the field at a different place where, than where he left, uh, it comes from behind and it uh, exits the field in a, in a different corner, uh, going onto the basically the, uh, the main road. That's important because as a result, people, it seems that the tank left uh, the field north of uh, Don Burgett. And people have for a long time assumed that the tank that helped Don Burgett was the one destroyed at Dead Man's Corner. And if you look at the uh, map on the right, you can see there's three places where tanks were attacked in the, in the, the records we have. So there's multiple uh, options and there is no reason. Uh, well, if you only think there was only one tank attacked and destroyed, then of course he must have been some uh, south of the uh, out of that mass corner but there's no reason for that actually but we'll come come back to that but i think this is important to realize uh the movement uh the approach of the tanks uh, how one of them uh, can have simply have moved off the field of off the road into the field where don burgett was fighting uh and then exited uh only to be attacked later on and, and these are and just to confirm that's what mag's looking at see the dotted line here folks uh that that's where mag is mag is in that field there so we've been on there's great shot of the church there mag so i i should just let mag do her own thing because she's brilliant at finding these shots so this is the field we think one of these tanks came into the tank and when we talk about don baguette if you haven't already fo folks read don baguette's book kurahi at screaming eagle in normandy just go and get it. there are various editions of it it describes the action here from his point of view perfectly some great drama in it definitely worth reading so Mag is looking into the field there. There's a see the church in the background of a reference. So the church is here. So she's looking across this field towards there. So that a, a, a 70th tank battalion, Stuart M5 tank, went in this field here. And so this is what was happening 77 years ago today. A tank went in this field by this same direction Mag is standing at. Great shots, Mag. Absolutely stunning. Do you want to move on to your next location, Mag? Because we've got that bit covered now. Neil's and Karen's story, and you can drive on to your next. We've got we're putting Mag to so much work tonight, um, so uh, she's got lots to do, but that's fine. She 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 likes to be busy, I think. So I'll put it back on the maps again while Mag drives off. So this is where this confusion has come from because Don Burgett's account was a classic account read by every historian of a certain age. Myself, we've all read it. And it helps to kind of seal the deal about which tank is where and wh who was knocked out in what tank. But as you say, there were three tanks in this area and they've got a bit confused over the years. Yes, and it's, of course, perfectly understandable. There's a very famous photo of Dead Man's Corner with, with a tank. Uh, it's been written about in, in numerous books. Don Burkett was one of the first, but it had also been in... Uh, in SLA uh, Marshall's uh, Night Drop, which is also an, uh, an interesting book, uh, and so this is an this is an this is a well-known event, uh, and with Don describing and himself making the direct link between what happened at Dead Man's Corner and and the tank that supported him, it it seems like a logical conclusion for everyone, but it's more complicated once you start to realize there were more tanks involved in the fighting. Uh, and they were attacked at several different places, which is <coughs> confusing and also leaves uh, interesting options available and yeah. makes it inter still interesting to, to, to talk about and to consider the options. 
So just as we can clear, folks, Mag was going in this field here. So that's where she was. She was parked here. Now she's driving off and she's going up to the church, the village now because you want to get across this idea of the high ground and reference back to what Neil said about von der Heidt, the Felschermeyer command, and where that was. And you'll get an idea there of how high that that point is, comparatively speaking. So she's driving off. That's why she's dropped out the feed there for a second. And again, thanks to everyone for the supporting images for these shows. These are great, these images from 10 years ago. Now there's this massive, great museum there. and uh, But that gives an idea of what the junction was like at the time. But again, to remind ourselves, the original road junction came, the original N13 came down here. And now it's over about half a mile over to the right where it now is the main road to Cherbourg, as we said. And I bet just to reference the focus, some reference of it. So Don Baguette. And we have to thank the late Don Burgett because he can I forget which year this was. I think this might have been 2010. And me and Sean Claxton, who's also a bit of a dead man's corner armor ex expert, you've seen him on various shows. We took Don to basically where Niels and Sean and the people at Robert's Armories had put this information to. And we put this to Don. We showed him the location Mag is taking you to shortly. And he kind of did come round to our way of thinking and say, yeah, you, you're right. I think I was where you say I was. And um, and it was really great when you get a veteran who is amenable to discussions about the fact that he may have slightly got the location. I mean, he was only about 100, 200 yards away from where he said he was, but it, it, you'll find out later when Mag gets there. I'm, I'm rambling now, but yeah, I missed Don a lot. He died a few years ago, and I spent many, many a happy day with him in Normandy, and uh, what a wonderful storyteller, and, uh, and, and sometimes would be humble enough to admit when he got things wrong. Yes, it's it's absolutely amazing how Don uh, supported our research uh, basically from the start. He had been in contact uh, with uh, uh, with Mr. Roberts, who who wrote also a book about uh, the 70th uh, tank battalion, uh, which is one the first place where basically the, the story of Dead Man's Corner, as shown uh, myself and uh, Mr. Roberts, uh, uh, in, uh, our version of it was presented. And he, he spent a lot of time on the phone talking to Don, uh, talking about options, uh, talking about how exactly uh, what you wrote this, uh, what do you mean by that? And Don was always a perfect gentleman, uh, very interested in helping, uh, going out of his way, not at all stuck to, well, I wrote this at that time, uh, this is how it was, and that's that's the end of it. And also, yeah. we, 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 must, we mustn't forget that what Don wrote, a wonderful book, but it's not a history book. It's basically his experiences. The recollection, yeah. It's a recollection. And any recollection is about making also about making sense of what you experienced. And had he known there were multiple uh, tanks being knocked out uh, and attacked, he might have come to a different conclusion. So it's perfectly understandable why you wrote things the way you did, especially after uh, SLA Marshall uh, wrote Night Drop which adds some uh, additional drama to the Dead Man's Corner story. And it becomes also difficult to completely distance yourself from a version written by a very well-known person. Yeah. And, and it makes it this, this complication because you read these books and, and they'll say something like, I turned left or I turned right. And so you go there and you, turn, and you realize that left might be open to interpretation which way was he facing when he said left you know and you assume you the the historian assumes a, 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 a position when you go there you can match it all up and realize things are a bit so mag is back on location so mag is now in saint comme de mont village so um this is the church well what that's the other side of the church um so this is the church where well i'll let Niels remind us so about this 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 is the high ground where uh major uh von der height the sixth felsenmeyer commander was on june the 6th to, to work out from the roof from the the, the the tower up there exactly what was happening around him and there's now lots of monuments there uh joe byerly of i company 506 landed in a churchyard on the side of the church there's other memorials around there with then and now photos but um this is the high ground uh, that is is the is the feature there. That's that church you can see in a minute. Anything else you want to add about the church, Neil? As well, Mag is there. Uh, not particularly, but you can just if you just imagine here what was going on uh, from the height that climbs uh, climbs up here with his battalion commanders. They look over the over over the entire area towards the coast. They can see everything perfectly. It, it's not very far. The terrain in between is is quite flat. You have a great observation over there, and also the. The, the after action report of the regiment says, my God, if we had sufficient artillery from this position, we could have made so much, uh, given the allies so much trouble. 
so this is their focal point and from here they plan their operations and that's why this is a very significant and there's a lot of stories about what happens during the night and there's people killed there's people captured on both sides this is a, a very uh, intense area uh, for several days and the fighting on, on the 8th is also uh, incredibly heavy and, and very interesting and uh, the repercussions for later for the, the liberation and the battle for uh, Canton. Yeah, and eventually I may do a show about saint combe de mont but if you look in the official histories or the, the rendezvous with destiny, even the 101st Airborne people writing about it at the time called the fighting, oh, hold that shot there, Mac. They called it the snafu operation, so situation normal, all fucked up. It ended up being a really complicated action, different uh, companies coming in from different directions, but that, Mag is now looking straight down what would have used to be the old N, the N13 highway, straight down towards Carrington. So it's kind of south, southeast, that view there. But you can get this sense. If she had a, if she had a drive as well, she could film while she's driving, but she can't today because she's on her own. But this is this high ground, and she'll be driving off in a minute down to our next location. Brilliant camera work, Mag. We'll let you drive on down the hill to the field exit that will come into the conversation. And people are asking us already, Niels, about are we going to explain what happened to each of these three tanks? And, of course, yes, you will as we go through the show. Yes, so that's, yeah, that's saint Com de mont and uh, definitely worth visiting. And the Dennis Van, uh, Van den Brink is watching. And if, if, if you haven't read Dennis Van den Brink's book, he wrote a cracking little book about the 101st Airborne and Karen John has become one of the real experts about the fighting in that area and not just the 506. He talks about the glider guys and the artillery units. So he's watching tonight. We've also got Greg Way watching tonight, who's written a brilliant book about Falsha Maker histories. We've got Joe, ba Joe Balkowski, who's written about the 29th, and of course, written a classic book about Utah Beach that covers these actions. So we've got some really um, knowledgeable people watching today who, in their own right, have written about these same events. So um, lots of stuff to do. Mag can never resist going and showing the photos of the wreaths, so that's completely okay. Um, and, and again, we remind those who are watching our D-Day coverage, just because there aren't many Americans and Brits in Normandy this year or Canadians doesn't mean that the remembrance hasn't been going on. The French uh, and certain amounts of Belgians and Dutch visiting have been doing their usual wreath laying tributes, um, services, uh, remembrance services, it all carries on just as normal. Oh, and, and um, yeah, uh, I'll try and put a link to the books in there. If you go, if for those who want to know, find Dennis Van Den Brink's books. Uh, um, there's a show where he was part of the Purple Heart Lane show we did last year. So was Greg Way. Go back and find that show on World War II TV, and you'll be able to see the links to their books there. So I'll put it off because Mag, Mag's driving now. So I'll put it on, um, put it on PowerPoint again. So Mag was here in the village. If you're following where we are. So she started over here near where the, the old junction road junction used to be from the road from Utah Beach. She drove down here to where the field entrance was. She now has gone up into saint Com de mont And now she's going to drive down the hill and she's going to stop just exactly here for the other view of the field. And Neil will continue the story. And then she'll go the last half an hour or so. She'll all be walking around the corner itself. So it's there's plenty of stuff coming. We're having to kind of work around Mag's driving, so that's why we're going back and forth through the story. But hopefully you're 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 you're, you're following it all okay. And um, yeah, so beautiful shots of San Comte de Mont. So um, uh, let's talk. Continue this story about the the Tampa Town coming down the road, Niels, and where they move. I'll find the map again. Yeah. First of all. Uh, the company of this particular battalion, the 70th Tank Battalion, was already uh, earmarked to support the 101st Airborne Division of, uh, as soon as they landed on D-Day, basically. So that was in the, it was in the, the invasion plans. Uh, the other battalion, other companies from this battalion that with the, with the Shermans are supporting basically the, the 4th Armored uh, of the 4th Infantry Division uh, moving towards uh, the north, moving towards St. Mary Glees. Uh, so they were already uh, intended to to uh, to support the battalion of the, the 101st Airborne Division. Uh, this particular company, D Company, uh, had landed uh, with three LCTs. Uh, there was a first uh, LCT. I'll, I'll look up the numbers. Yeah, there was a, a LCT 2424 landed uh, first platoon, tank 15, tank 16, and uh, uh, a tank recovery vehicle. Uh, based on a uh, uh, basically obsolete uh, uh, M3 tank, uh, medium tank, 
So that's 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 the first one. So that's seven uh, M5A1 tanks landed uh, by that particular uh, LCT. Uh, then we had the 2040 uh, 40, uh, LCT, which landed a uh, second and third uh, platoon minus tank 15. And then finally, we had uh, the 21st, uh, 35th uh, LC of LCT 2135, um, which landed uh, tank 17 uh, with elements of the uh, reconnaissance uh, troops of the 4th Infantry Division. Um, what we are seeing here is a shot uh, supposedly of on D taken on D-Day, which shows uh, one of the light tanks of the of the battalion. Uh, this photo is interesting for a number of reasons. Uh, we have, of course, the, the African American uh, servicemen here, uh, which you don't see on a lot of photos. Uh, unfortunately, one is uh, right in the way of the number of this particular tank. <laughs> uh, because this might very well be the tank destroyed later at Deadman's Corner. Yeah. And if that's the case, this is the last photo we have of the tank driver. You can if you would zoom in, you can you can see his head sticking out talking to to a to, to a soldier standing outside. So that's uh, that there there he is. Uh then we have someone up in the turret. Uh either a, a loader or the tank commander, but I think it's the it's the it's the loader. And then if you zoom to the right, uh standing next to the tank a bit further there's a you see the you can see the tank helmet uh, of the the guy on the left here uh, talking to to another uh, uh, soldier uh, just chatting and this might very well be a uh, tank uh, tank number two and why there's a number of reasons to think that uh, if you look just behind uh, the guy obscuring the number which is on the rear of the tank there is a few elements of white visible which could be a 12. And that 12 is going to be important when we talk about the tank later. Uh, yeah. You can also see uh, the name of the tank, uh, Delphia, and uh, the commander of the of this particular uh, tank that was destroyed at Dead Man's Corner, who we think it is, has had a very clear uh, link to Philadelphia. So there's quite a lot of things to say that this might be the case uh, and that yeah. this is the identifi identity of this particular tank. Might also have been tank two, uh, but just what just the, the white we can see behind the, the soldier stand, standing in front of the number uh, suggests it's it's either a 12 or two yeah and uh, so th yeah. these are the, there's the the the, um, the breakdown of the unit again now mag is back on location again she's got to her next location so let me remind you where she is folks so we're, we're all clear and up to speed what we're doing so she has come down the road from saint com du mont and she is just exactly here. Okay, so I'll just put it back. I'll come back to you in a second so you can show the church again. So she's just here at this entrance, this field here. So she's across. That's where she was earlier over there. And now she's over here. So we're in this same area here. So I'll put it back on mag shot there. So you can see there really the drop down there, the elevation. I don't, don't get run over mag, but try and show that view down towards Carrington. Yeah, I see it off in the distance there, a car going down the hill then. If you pan around so we can see back the church again, if you wouldn't mind, if we can see the church from there. Yeah, there's a church there. So there's San Carmen de Moore. Now, let's go run through the, the, the geography of this location because I want Maggie to show these high earth banks that we have on the side of the road there. This is your typical hedgerow country there because this is this is important to understand where we are and then the field entrance because Don Baguette talks about high banks, doesn't he, Niels? Yes, he does, which is uh, quite an... Uh, the way he describes them and the height of them is, is quite remarkable. He, he talks about, uh, I believe, six feet high, uh, which is... Uh, I mean, the hedgerows in Normandy are high, but the banks are in particularly very high. And you can see on this uh, uh, shot from Mac, basically that they start to rise... And it's basically what they do. They 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 they, they increase in uh, in height, and that's what uh, also what matches uh, one of the few places that matches what Don Burgett is describing. Uh, at some point, uh, he's way ahead of his uh, of his other troops with a couple of other guys, uh, and they and they can see Germans crossing the road, uh, climbing up uh, the, the banks on the other side of the road, and he and they're, they're just a few hundred meters away. Maybe even uh, something like that, and he describes climbing down uh, 
uh, on the road, setting up a machine gun, firing towards where these Germans are, are, are coming from, which is basically where, 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 uh, where Mac is standing, in that direction. Um, and he describes sliding down and later climbing back up. And I understand that when you took him to this particular field, uh, because it right because the, the banks rise, uh, Don was able to say, no, this it's too low here, and this is this is how it was, uh, which is also uh, a great uh, little confirmation of uh, of how steep it is. And basically, what we can see here is uh, this road has been built by cutting through the top of the hill, which is yeah. Quite quite normal. Uh, so it's not as steep, and you can use the the debris and the rubble you get in that way also to build sort of a ramp on the on the southern uh, side of the uh, of of that man's corner. And the previous interpretations of Dunbergat being south of that man's corner is basically impossible because there are no high banks like this. Yeah, and that's what what sort of sells us on that he must have been in this particular area. Yeah, this is uh, the, and, and where Max Danny is basically the exit point of the of the of the light tank. So, that, so and, to, to, to recap, folks, the tank has come down the road here, into the field where Magos were, yeah, across the field, and come out here, and and this is the action that Don Baguette describes in his book. And uh, I also ought to reference in just to, just to reference the fact um, Dennis Van den Brink points out that the well, the first American paratroopers in Normandy was killed in this location. So that's on June the sixth. Gene Sellers. If you've been to American uh, uh, the American Cemetery at Omaha Beach, in the film there, they talk about Bob Secrest and Gene Sellers. They're two of the personal stories, or they used to do there. Um, so, because someone said in the side earlier, did any paratroopers land between San Commodore and Carrington? Well, they did, but not really intended. The closest drop zone to San Commodore is drop zone I, uh, drop zone D, which is about a mile and a half away. But some ended up landing there by mistake. Joe Byerly famously in, in the village itself. Um, and in this case, Gene Sellers, a pathfinder, landed exactly where Mag is. But Mag should be in the field now. If I go back to Mag's image, oh, you're just showing us how thick the hedgerows are. Well done, Mag. Have you found a poppy yet, Mag? People are waiting for your po poppy shot. You haven't found one yet. But if you just pop into the field there, Mag, so we can see you back across to the main road, that would be fantastic. And I'll let Niels carry on talking. But these are these high banks. For those who've got Don Baguette's book, go and thumb through it. Find the chap, the bit where he talks about the action on Dead Man's Corner. And this is where we are now 99.9% .9 certain he actually, well, I say we, I wasn't involved in the research at all. Well, a little bit. I helped take Don there. So there we are. That's the view across there to the other side of the field where Mag was early. And you can, again, you can see that high ground. And there is the back. You hold it on that shot there. There's the museum. And then beyond the museum, it drops off dramatically off towards Carrington. Brilliant. So let that. So what? So the tank. Let, get back to the tank action, Niels. I know I'm pop, moving around, hopping back and forth. So the, the tank comes out there. Where was it going next? Well, uh, according to Don uh, Burgett's description, and he's the only one basically uh, uh, we have to, to report on, on on this particular event. This tank uh, exited uh, the field, got onto the the main road, and headed north. Um, and there is the question is what happened ne next to this particular tank uh, von der Heide later uh, after the war he wrote a report uh, there's also another one uh, and it, basically they say there was a tank knocked out at the southern entrance or southern exit of saint condiment uh, by an anti-tank gun which which is possible uh, the question is how how heavy was it damaged uh, was uh, where did it go afterwards because there is no fo uh, photograph of that particular tank. So this is a bit of a mystery. And this is also uh, an interesting option to interpret who, who was the person, who's, uh, the tank commander who supported Don Burgett. But we'll get to that uh, at a later point, because there's a few stories uh, that there's several options still. And there's, each story has things that fit beautifully, and there's another details that are uh, confusing things. But that's just the way it is uh, when you study uh, history from just a few accounts. Yeah. So again, folks, if you mind where we are, because Mag's driving down to the corner. That's her, her last movement for the show. Her next, uh, all the rest of it is going to be down near the corner here. So we were just here on that, say the old M13 from San Commodore uh, down towards um, Carrington there. And so she was just at the entrance of this field here and these high banks here that Don talks about. And when Mag gets down to this corner here, which will be there in a, very, in a minute, 
there are no high banks around there. And that's, that's as, as Neil said, that's why we don't think the action could have happened there because the, the geography doesn't uh, match up. And Don was so good at remembering the geography of things. He may have sometimes got the time of day wrong or th that kind of thing, but he always had a very, very good ability to describe if you saw floods or high ground or church or hedgerows or stone wall, he would say that the wall was five foot high. You'd go there 60 years later and the wall would be five foot high. He was brilliant at that kind of detail. And uh, I remember when I was there with Sean, with Niels's work there, we were showing him these, these earth banks. He kind of had this eureka moment where he realized that he, you know, he, that he you know, Niels and Robert, Robert, Mr. Roberts and Sean were correct. And he was not wrong, but he had just, his information wasn't quite precise, I suppose is the way to say it. So brilliant stuff. I'll put it on Niels. So Niels, how are we getting on? Are you, are you still enjoying enjoying it? Is this good? Is Mag doing oh, yes. well? It's good stuff. Yeah. So Mag is moving down to our last stop to stop at the corner at the corner there. So um, there's the other action we want to talk about. Um, uh, well, I'll let you 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 dictate what we're going to talk about next, Niels, because I'm getting all excited because I'm really enjoying myself. So um, I'm going to hand over to you and you start talking. I'm all excited. I'm going to calm down, have a drink of water. You can talk for a bit. Uh. Maybe you can go to a slide. Uh, let's, see, see, let's see what we have. Um, let's let's go back to the map again. Let's talk about let's yeah. talk about the German positions around the corner. Why don't we do that? Yeah. Uh, can you get, do the other map? That's, I think that's a bit more useful because this is a quite a blurry area of what was what was going on. So the yeah this one. Uh, so basically, what we can see here is uh, we have uh, Beaumont on the on the on the high on the on the road uh, from Denmark's okay. corner to uh, to San uh, to Sa uh, yeah, to uh, to Utah Beach, there, and then we have uh, La Drouerie uh, towards the, the the south, and La Drouerie basically is the boundary between uh, the the uh, battalion, the second battalion, which was coming back from the north to establish a line. Uh, you can also sort of, if you look at the, at the terrain, you can also see the, the lower areas. You can see there's sort of a, a hill uh, around saint Comte du mont So you can you can imagine uh, how they figured they were going to defend this area. Establish a, you can establish a fairly sm uh, short front uh, and try to control this particular area once they had realized that there was no way they were going to attack uh, because there was far too much opposition. Artillery was, uh, was coming in. So that's that's that, so that's what we're facing right here. And Beaumont uh, was based. There was a lot of heavy fighting about Beaumont, the hundred and uh, the first battalion coming uh, south towards Beaumont, being attacked on their right flank by almost certainly elements of the second uh, Falschenberger uh, battalion. Uh, so they were coming in there. Uh, there were already uh, American troops landed on D-Day, which were still in the Bas Adeville uh, area. Also, give it. Uh, giving the Germans in that area a lot of trouble. So during the day, the Germans are already starting to realize they're in trouble, even though they're being attacked by one single uh, American battalion, which is under strength at that time. But the Germans have not built very strong position at this time. The, the second battalion is coming uh, coming back towards the south, they're establishing their lines. They're sort of linking up with, with, the, with the, the third battalion of the, of the, of the regular infantry. So it's it's a bit of a mess, and this is probably the reason that Don is able to to make it. Uh, at some point, uh, they charge ahead to deal with the enemy, and basically, the things get confused. They keep running, and they find themselves far far ahead of, of all friendly forces. So with a group of five men, they're there. Uh, now what? Uh, so they take up the position on the on on the road, firing the. A 30 caliber machine gun uh, northwards. So that's basically what we have, uh, what, what we have going on. In the meantime, the rest of the battalion uh, and D Company, which has been brought in to reinforce a uh, first battalion of the 506, are still moving towards what is now Dead Man's Corner. Uh, so they're they're ahead, uh, Don's group, but their support basically coming up, but they don't know when. So they're, they're, they're slugging it out, they're doing their best, and this is, of course, the very iconic uh, location uh, in Normandy. It's 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 a must-see location. Uh, Michel de Tre from the museum has also provided some of the, the photographs uh, we're using here today. Uh, there's a, 
there's a, a replica of a uh, M5A1 uh, uh, Stuart tank, slightly later type of, than the one used at the uh, Dead Man's Corner, but it's uh, it, it's it's a, it's a minor uh, minor difference. So that's that's what we're seeing here. Uh, of course, the entire area has been changed uh, by the new layout of of the of the roads, uh, which it, which if you are not aware of the situation, it. The old N13 is less important now than the, the road leading towards uh, Utah Beach, and this is also where we can see the the 12 on the on the side of the tank uh, and the the logo of the of the of the battalion, uh, uh, the so-called uh, an, uh, an armored turtle basically with a, a turtle with a tanker's helmet, uh, uh, known better as uh, Joe Packerwood, uh, which was the battalion symbol, and it's also on uh, painted on this uh, on this particular. Uh, uh, vehicle, and this is a uh, a great shot of the after the after the battle of the of this particular corner. So this gives you a bit of an idea what it looked like at the time. There was a garden, uh, a well stylized garden in front of the of the house, and the house was used as a as a command post, but also as an aid station. Uh, so it has changed uh, quite a bit, but. Uh, if you use the old photos, uh, it's it's very easy to spot what was going on and to get an impression uh, of what was basically a house at a beautiful location overlooking uh, low ground towards Carantan, uh, which became the focal point of uh, of heavy heavy fighting in those basically uh, two three days in uh, in 1944. And there's that view down to set that down towards Carrington there that you can see that drop off in high ground and and I guess in a minute Niels we're we're coming up for sort of fifty minutes now we'll have to bring in the story of the the you know the, of the exactly how the iconic photo came about in fact we've got two or three versions of the same photo but if if you if you, as you're walking that way Mag try and show us that view without getting run over don't get run over and the funny thing folks is when Mag is walking around with her stabilizer and the camera. They think she's a cop doing um, speed camera stuff. They think she's uh, so everyone slows down when they go past. Or it just could be natural respect for Mag's camera work. I don't know, but I think they think she's a she's a cop doing undercover filming. But there, so there's that view down straight down what eventually became Purple Heart Lane. Look for last year's show with Greg Way, Dennis, Dennis Van uh, Den Brink, and Paul Ak uh, Adamick when we talked about the dead, uh, the Purple Heart Lane show. So that's that view down to Carrington. And if you spin around now, you're going to show the view off towards Utah Beach again, the road coming in there. If you can get, you hopefully get kind of the bend in the road. There's kind of an S bend in the road. If you look up there, the kind of road goes round the left. And in the background, hold that shot there, Mag. Whoops. Uh, you could sure be able to see, folks, that same orientation there. If you look in the photo there, you can see the road kind of goes round the right. And then around the left and you can see that mag has got that same view there and obviously as neil said they put the replica tank within the grounds of the museum actually of course would have been hit in the road and, that, and i guess we're coming to that point in the story and the identification of that tank so um brilliant stuff mag we want to walk back across there to where the tank was that's superb don't get run over so we've talked about Don Baguette on the road between the corner and San Commodore. How did this tank end up getting here? And which tank is it? So for clarification, uh, for those who yeah. are following. Yeah, basically, uh, early early in the day, uh, the advance towards uh, San Commodore uh, and the high ground had been supported by elements of the uh, 746 tank battalion, uh, their A company had, had sent in several tanks which supported uh, the advance. Then late in the afternoon, early in the evening, uh, these get swapped out for uh, these light tanks to, su to support uh, uh, the attack and continue the advance. Uh, tanks have a tendency in, in, in Bokash country to spend a lot of ammunition, especially machine gun ammunition, spraying everything. And that's fine, but at some point you're out of ammunition. And that's basically when they brought in the, probably the reason why they brought in the lighter tanks to continue the, the push of first battalion uh, into the evening and towards that crucial high ground. So this is the tank leading that particular uh, advance. And it it, it passed uh, the, the very dangerous uh, crossroads. Uh, there's German forces around it. Uh, it's confusing that nobody really holds the area. Uh, so they this particular tank gets through, uh, moves towards the, the high, uh, towards the corner. Uh, and gets hit by a Panzerfaust fired by uh, 
Oberkafreiter Fischer, uh, a messenger from uh, the Fallschirmjäger regiment, and he takes out this particular tank. And there's a very there's a number of people who have claimed this is the name of of the person who did it, but there's only one. Uh, the after action report says in front the tank that was destroyed and knocked out in front of the regimental uh, HQ was uh, knocked out by this particular German uh, Oberkafreiter. So that's that's. The guy who well, where do we think the Panzerfaust came from? If Mag Panzer came around the left, where do you think? Where do you, say stop when you think the guy was when he fired? If we have any idea at all, well, you need to. If you look at the impact of the damage on the particular, he was uh, no, he's further to the. He must have been further to the left because there is a yeah. hit on the left front of the tank. So it's he's either coming from just a bit over to the left from what we're seeing here, or he was. Yeah, he was either across the road or he was in the the, the other corner. So uh, you got you got various hits on the tank there. There's one. There's one no, on the, uh, near no, the gun. Th no, that's not a hit. There's only one hit. Oh, sorry, there, there, sorry, there, there, there. Yeah, that one there's there. a, Yeah, there's a hit, uh, which is also very important. This is also typical damage for uh, basically a hollow charge weapon. Uh, uh, so so that's what we're what, that's what we're seeing here. Uh, uh, I think you check something a, a bit later. But uh, so there's one hit, and it hits the tank at a very useful uh, place, basically. It hits right where the driver's head is. The driver's on the left side of the tank, and this this impact is straight where his head is. And if, if a hollow charge weapon goes off, it basically sprays uh, molten material in into a tank. Very, very... Not at not tremendously forceful once it starts to spread out but if but in itself it penetrates and then it spreads out if you if your head's directly behind it there's just no chance you're going to survive it yeah and that's the view there so that's so the panzer faust would have been somewhere maybe where mag is or maybe for maybe off to mag's right I, somewhere yeah further, so, further, yeah. To, further, further, to, further the right, to the right probably, yeah. not the way making you move mag i mean because don't get run over yeah, and the, the question is, was it on this side of the road or was it straight oh, across from where Max looking right now? That's that's difficult uh, difficult to say. Also because it's where was the tank hit exactly? Was it pushed out of the way? Exactly. Uh, so it's these are the typical things that in tank but uh, in tank actions, it's very difficult unless a tank stays exactly put where it is destroyed. Uh, Greg Way is saying Oberkafreiter Fischer must have fired from the Carrington side of the junction. So yeah, yeah that's that's yeah. yeah. If, if Mag can cross the road now, if you can go, if you don't get run over, Mag. If you want to go over there where the crash barrier kind of thing is, are there? So we think maybe from over here, that could be the possible angle. So over there somewhere. Yeah, something like this. And you and you swing round left there to where the tank was. I'll, sh I'll bring the, show the photo again. That would seem to explain. That's assuming, as you said there, Niels, the tank is in the angle it was when it was actually hit, which we don't know for certain. No. So that's, but that's, it was the, because the layout, it's almost certainly, it was somewhere on the southern side uh, at the canton side of the road, where exactly is just impossible to say, but it's, yeah. the, the impact is just telling, that's what the impact is telling us. Yeah. So it's time time to start talking about who was in this tank, because um, if you check on the internet, folks, there the old information gives us one name and the current information gives us a different name. So who did we used to think was hit at this junction? Niels? Uh, at some point uh, earlier this century, I think so, 2007, 2010, that period sort of, they came up, uh, I don't know who came up with it, but they introduced the name uh, Walter T. Anderson, First Lieutenant Walter T. Anderson. We can see him here on the on the photo, which uh, is one of the photos Mr. Roberts uh, provided uh, through his contact with veterans and families and so forth. And he is buried uh, in Normandy. And it's quite it, I am all, I'm still uh, surprised that people came up with his name. Yes, uh, he's buried there. He was killed in this in this uh, rough uh, period of time. But there's a very important issue. This is an officer, and officers command uh, platoons basically. And this particular officer is not just any officer. This is the battalion's second in command. This is the maintenance officer, or also the acting as the uh, company XO. And he was supposed to be in tank 17. So in a traditional 
official, uh, the TOE of a, of a light tank battalion basically says you have a tank commander, which is either a, if it's a platoon leader or an, or a uh, HQ guy, it's an officer. In the other cases, it's uh, basically a sergeant. So, and each each platoon is commanded by a by a by a lieutenant, and the second uh, section, the last two tanks in a in a in a platoon are are basically commanded by a, a staff sergeant. So that's the what what that's the typical what you would expect. And if you can look at the tank that's destroyed at Dead Man's Corner, its number is twelve. And number twelve tank basically means this is the second. Yeah, there you can see it. You can see one uh, A means first army, seven uh, seventy, and then the triangle. Triangle stands for armor. In this case, uh, seventy a tank battalion, and then it says D twelve. And tank number twelve is the second tank of third platoon. There is no good reason why Lieutenant Anderson, who was the battalion uh, XO, was in this uh, particular tank. And also, if you go into the records, the company diary also specifically states at some point, today we found tank 17, because tank 17 was at some point destroyed, and learned Lieutenant Anderson had been killed. So that's Lieutenant Anderson's tank, one of the two HQ tanks, and as Paul's pointing out, that's tank 12. And that's the one destroyed at Dead Man's Corner. So Lieutenant Anderson, unless you have a very good reason uh, to say he borrowed someone's tank, you can rule him out, especially because we can link him to the tank. We expect him to be in tank number 17. And if you remember the, the landing craft uh, footage or photographs from the beginning, uh, that particular landing craft was his landing craft. So that's his yeah. his tank that that we showed there, and that might also explain why they lost track of him. Because if the landing craft came in later than the other ones, uh, he may have been struggling to link up with the uh, with the rest of his company. And we have a feeling that that's why the company command uh, company diaries at some point says today we found uh, several days later uh, found Lieutenant Anderson's uh, tank. So there's yeah. a chance he he was separated, and there is another story that could suggest uh, he was uh, killed while supporting uh, uh, other 80, 101st Airborne elements uh, near Uesville because he was killed by mortar fire, which matches the description of an American veteran. Uh, yeah. I mean, this, and, you know, this report you sent me, or rather Robert's Armour, you know, they, yeah. they suggested he was killed one mile north of San Commodore. But say, so Anderson, we may yet not know exactly where he was killed, but we we are pretty certain he wasn't killed here. So that we're yeah. in this in this history game, as you sort out one mystery, it means you don't sort out another one. You know, there's an ongoing process here. But who the people who were in this tank is important. And 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 here here are the images. So I'll let you explain who these two gentlemen are. Well, there's four in the tank, two wounded, two killed outright. Uh, yeah. Uh, so first of all. Just go. Uh, we have seen the impact on the tank right at the driver's head. So we expect uh, the driver to have been a casualty, which is also one of the key clues to identifying uh, the, uh, the crews. Because if you look at the, the reports on the casualties, they list two different locations, but only one of them uh, has, has a candidate for this particular event. And that name is Aaron D. Uh, Curry. And it's a bit old because he was, a, as a tank driver, you were supposed to have a technical rank, either a T4 or a T5 in, in, a, in this particular situation, which uh, Curry wasn't. But from the general orders of the battalion, we know uh, Curry was qualified to drive tracked vehicles. Uh, that, that happened, I think, uh, late 1943. Uh, he had been... He had apparently received training and was officially qualified to drive. So this is not the, uh, perhaps the, the rank you would expect, but this is someone who was qualified to drive a tank. So that's what we can. Yeah, and as you can see, he was killed one mile northeast of Carantown by anti-tank fire, by burns from anti-tank fire, which is a very good description of what happens if you're hit by a hollow charge, a shaped good, charge good weapon. Good but horrible, I would add. Yes, that's there, somebody yeah. said it's not, not a in, very nice way to go. It, this case, it's probably he was probably killed before he realized what happened. Yeah. yeah so, yeah. so, yeah, it's 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 a terrible way to go, but it, at least it was a, a quick one. Yeah. This indeed. is this is just 
there's a hit right next to your head. I mean, it's it's over. Uh, so we have that particular location for that particular soldier. And if you start looking through the list, another name comes up. And that name is uh, Sergeant Anthony I. Tomaszewski. Same location. Uh, he was killed uh, as with uh, requested uh, individ individual deceased personnel fi uh, files for, these, for all these casualties. And he was killed uh, by heavy uh, upper body uh, trauma, uh, damage to his skull, his jaw, uh, his, uh, his uh, left humerus. So it's still a bit, what, what happened exactly to him is, in case of recovery, it's, it's pretty clear. Hit next to his head, game over. Uh, in the case of of Sergeant Tomaszewski, it's it's less clear. It may have it may have been uh, a grenade uh, that went off, uh, but he he's, he received uh, heavy damage. And what we're seeing here is on the left uh, a photo of Sergeant uh, Tomaszewski. This was provided by his son. He left a wife and a young son. Uh, and Mr. Tomaszewski, his son, never really knew what happened to his uh, to his father. He knew killed in Normandy, and that was about it. This is also one of the things why it's very important just to keep researching these stories, uh, figure out what happened, because he, I mean, he's, we're so many years uh, after the war right now, so he's, he's an old man himself. And they're, they're, their children are still around at this particular time. Uh, a lot of them are. So if you can help uh, them get clarity into what happened, it's, it's so, so rewarding. We got yeah. a, put a, uh, a name to a face, and he got to know more about what had happened to his father. Yeah. And that's, that's and we basically. don't have a photo of Curry at the moment. All we have at the moment is is a gravestone. Which uh, yeah, which... and why I cho chose to include this also this particular photo is this is a traditional white, perf uh, standard uh, grave marker for uh, for a soldier, and it, he has been forgotten by history. And this is what this particular photo shows. It's dirty. It's full of crime. It's absolute. It's it's algae all over the place. Uh, you can look up online where he was buried. And if you live in the area, uh, just go there. It's a very sad story. Also, when you read the I IDPF, uh, his mother being uh, completely uh, destroyed by the events. Uh, his wife trying to move on, uh, getting clashes between the two, fighting over the body. Who's 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 in who can decide what to do with the body is he going to remain uh, in the end the mother gets uh, the that's permission to to bring back uh 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 the body to the united states but he has well he has no he has no child uh, he has no children of his own apparently no uh, extended family who remember him and this is how we found uh, found his grave and this photo was provided by the cemetery itself and they, they did clean it up uh, on one of the other photos, but this is powerful to include because yeah. we're talking about a lot of well-known names, but the guy who we know was killed at Dead Man's Corner, people, we didn't know his name and his grave had been uh, basically forgotten. completely forgotten. Well, I'm just going to make sure we um, we can say thank you to Mag now because Mag has to leave now to get back in time for curfew. We have lockdown at nine o'clock here. So Mag... Uh, I'll put your microphone on again. If you want to just say that, we want to say thank you to you, everybody. So thanks, Mag. You're welcome. Super. Your lovely weather, exceptional yeah. camera work again. People yeah. think you've done fantastic work again. Um, Beautiful and weather, yeah. It's just mm -hmm. so great. People appreciate the fact that we're doing this live, 77 years on, in the same location. We're showing the incredible camera work there. So. I'll drop you at the meeting, Mag. Thank you very okay. much. I'll get the dinner on in a minute. But with me and me and Niels will just finish off and conclude a bit about the legend, the legend of Dead Man's Corner. So thanks very much. See you later. Thanks. Bye. Thanks to you too. Bye. So, um, Niels, we, we've kind of come to the end of things a little bit. I'll put up the iconic photo again, just to round things off, just so we can kind of you know talk about because. This is an interesting study. When we did the John Steele show with Marty about how legends are born, because the whole dead man's going, I'm sure there are people watching who haven't quite made the connection about this because this tank supposedly sat there for several days with a kind of a body hanging out the top of it. And it, amongst the guys in the 101st and maybe Tampa Town guys, they said, don't go beyond that junction with a dead guy in it. Be careful. There's Germans at that bit in the road where the tank knocked is knocked out. And this evolved into Dead Man's Corner. That's how that place earned its name. 
And, you know, so it's not that the museum or anything is trying to dramatically inflate. This is the, this is the name it earned at the time. But when, as you've done, and Robert Samri and Sean have done, and you actually investigate this story, you realize that it's quite tricky to find and verify exactly what happened because that photo, there is no body in that photo. So when, what date do we think that was taken or do we not really have an idea? Except obviously it was early June sometime. Yeah, I think Mark Bender has a pretty good, probably has a pretty good idea on what this, I think this was June 10th or something. Um, and there's a few things, uh, it's Dead Man's Corner, but there's also uh, at least one uh, American body laying on the road in this particular area. So maybe he was the, the reason for uh, to name it Dead Man's Corner. It's all sorts of rabbit, rabbit holes you uh, you can da go down on. And that's that's the thing. But just the popular story is Commander killed, hanging out of the turret for several days. You can, of course, ask yourself, at what point does an officer say, pull, pull that guy down, it's bad for morale, take him down. So how... If, if that was the case, and Don Baguette says he saw the tank commander, not necessarily of this tank, but of a tank, uh, upper half of his body, uh, he, he saw it uh, the next day. Uh, he was uh, very adamant about that. Uh, so it's that, that part is, but the dram dramatized version, hanging out there for days, to what extent is it true? And there's also another uh, version that's interesting, uh, because through the work of Mark Bando, who... Uh, uh, interviewed uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, I forget his name of uh, company uh, F502. He said there was no uh, no one visible sticking out of the tank. He said you could see the driver when you look through an angle through one of the hatches. Uh, and whether or not that's sufficient, because uh, one of the things that's important, it's very difficult to extract uh, a dead body from a tank. It's it's very it's unpleasant. And it's difficult. It's very yeah. cramped. And the thing is, because the in a, in tanks like this, the, the drivers and the co-drivers hatches they tend to bounce, so they can get in the way of the the turning of the turret. So they are buttoned down from the inside, so you can't really exit. And, you, and also on all the photos, you can see all the hatches are open except for the driver's one, which is an indication uh, that he, I think he's still the famous photo. He's still in there. And yeah. that's that's also uh, you had a, sh a shot with the, the basically the, the the death certificates, and they show two different dates. Yeah, the first one says June seventh, and I'm convinced that that's because his buddies reported him killed at that day. Then later they came up with another one, June twelfth, which is almost certainly uh, when his body was retrieved and identified. So that's. That's probably what happened, and that's also why the date on his uh, on his grave is incorrect. Yeah, uh, it should be it should be June seventh. There's no doubt about it. If you look at all the army uh, records, it's it's June the seventh. But the grave registration people working on it, they could only do at that time what they found. They identified a body, and this one went into uh, into this June twelfth when was the latest version of it, and th that's the version that's stuck on on the documents and on his gravestone. But that's not what uh, that's not what happened. But it goes to illustrate that it took probably five days, four or five days before they retrieved his body from that tank, which is uh, they. I, I'm sure that they wouldn't have waited for the grave registration people to to pick up the the body of the the tank commander uh, sitting visibly in the turret. So he may have been placed next to it. He may have been uh, transported uh, much earlier. Uh, there's a different date also for him. So that's probably uh, uh, what what happens. So uh, co private co uh, re remained in the in that tank for several days. Whether or not he's the particular the person who gave his name to the junction, uh, there's so many people basically who died there and combined. And maybe we shouldn't say dead man's corner with an A, but dead man's corner with an E. Yeah, because there were, yeah. yeah. And just want to show that photo there, uh, uh, just to kind of finish things off as well, because the, the tank ended up somewhere as well, of course. Yeah, but, uh, this particular tank is the other tank that was knocked out during that day. Uh, that's reported in the, the battalion records. Uh, that's tank number 10. Uh, this is uh, at the, the collection point. It's just uh, behind uh, uh, Lafayette. 
uh, there was a big uh, along the railroad was a big uh, collection point for uh, airplane as you can see in the back uh, and uh, uh, German armor here at the front uh, uh, Hotchkiss tank and there's the the, the M5 A1 Stuart with the number 10 yeah. on it and uh, the tank at Deadman's Corner a tank number 12 also ended up at this particular uh, location and there's a photo of that one which i don't own so we fortunately we can't use it here uh but that's yeah. uh yeah I, mean, I think it's you know this is what's intriguing and you know there's 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 all sorts of historians watching this joe balkovsky is watching greg way dennis is watching is that we've essentially been talking about we've mentioned no more than about eight or nine names tonight and there's discrepancies with just those eight or nine names so so when people read these books by these incredible historians about the 29th division doing this or 30th division the, the fact is there's lots and lots of areas where things are not precise where dates get transcribed incorrectly there's the information in the war diaries and the morning reports and the after action reports gets muddled or confused or the person who writing it gets killed. I mean, when we talk about the saint com du Mont action, which we're not going to go into in too much detail, but D Company 506, their commander, Jerry Gross, got killed in the Battle for saint com du Mont, and what he'd been writing about their company's exploits from June the 6th and 7th were in his pockets, kind of got buried with him. So you lose track of what they were doing. So you know, it's important that people like yourself and Greg and all these other people spend the time burrowing into these stories to try and get the truth. And the thing is, it just becomes a huge saga where as you push down, the light in the tunnel kind of keeps moving further and further away. But as you find a little bit here, a little bit there, and it's fantastic, absolutely fantastic for us to be able to, to be able to honor today these people. You know, these events were happening 77 years ago, yes, in today, June 7th and 8th, these events were happening around this corner. And it's not the it's not an operation. This we've done shows about totalize and track, you know, where we're talking about an entire division or in multiple divisions advancing. We're talking about you know three tanks and twenty people, and we've talked about it for an hour and a quarter. It just shows you how much information there is and how intriguing these things are. So for those who didn't know why Dead Man's Corner was called Dead Man's Corner, that's why it's called there. And I imagine. Because every, every 101st Airborne veteran I ever met who went anywhere near there, they all refer to Dead Man's Corner, but half of them hadn't even been there. So what was happening is it was passing on word of mouth. So like in the Band of Brothers about um, Spears and the prisoners, people are relating a story that they haven't indeed witnessed themselves. So they say, oh, there's a tank there. And then someone else tells a story to someone else. Because the other thing, the other narrative is there's always discussions about the tank burning. But if you look at the photo there, there doesn't seem to be much evidence of fire there to me. There is, there is, yeah, around the impact. If you look at the tracks, there it's possible there's fire damage on the tracks, which are rubber, uh, these rubber pads. So it's possible there was some fire there, but it's uh, there's no indication. Also, not when you the photo we can't use, there is no indication of a significant fire damage to it at all. But it's exactly the kind of thing that gets added to a story in the retelling, isn't it? The first person it gets telling, the tank got knocked out, the guy got killed. The next time the story gets tired, his body was hanging out in the tank for days. The next time, and the body was burnt because of the fire. And this is, these are how stories evolve. That's how that's how narrative, that's how the whole John Steele on the church in, in San Marie Glees ends up becoming a story of its own that takes on its own life. And uh, anyway, I think we'll need to bring things to an end for it. So that that has been a presentation I really, really enjoy giving. Niels, your people, your uh, respect, your knowledge. People think you're fantastic. Your book, July, we're looking at now for the first volume of your book. You will come on and talk about it. And don't forget, I will absolutely on Twitter and social media as soon as it's available to buy. You can guarantee I will be plugging it because we need more books that tell the German side. And this, this, this is the work Niels has been doing. So. There you are. Um, any concluding remarks, Niels? Remarks? Uh, no, just the general remark that the more famous a story is, the more important it gets to that someone uh, really looks into what really happened, go back to uh, uh, try to figure out what, uh, go back to basics, go through the records, figure out uh, what's correct, what's not correct, where things come from, uh, establish a timeline in the different versions. Uh, because that's the ultimately that's the only way to honor the people who were involved and we've talked about uh, three names well a few more but three names from the 70th tank battalion uh, who were killed in this particular period and they deserve to be uh, recognized for what they did and 
especially Private Curry, who, if you look at his uh, his grave, he deserves more attention than uh, for his sacrifice than what he's been getting over the last uh, many many decades. So if you're in the area, visit his grave, pay your respect. Uh, and there are so many untold stories of heroism of people doing their duty. Uh, just keep keep digging, look into a story if it fascinates you. Uh, the big stories, the small stories, just go for it. It takes time, but it's incredibly rewarding. And one of the highlights of this was um, finding uh, the son of uh, Sergeant Tomaszewski and being able to tell him more about what happened to his, his father, which is ultimately more about people, whether they're soldiers or whether they're family back home. So honor them by doing your research. Do you know which town in Georgia? He's from Georgia, but is the grave in Georgia? Uh, it's uh, it's in Annapolis, I I think, but it's been, it's it's been a while since I uh, I, we'll, I read we'll it out. It it, it's, yeah, it's the photo. The, the, this particular photograph is uh, has a geodata in it, so uh, it's it's very easy to find. But it's uh, I'll, I'll look up the uh, the exact. And if you find, do, uh, go to find a grave, you'll, you'll find it. Okay, superb stuff. Uh, I'm trying to find it while we're there. I can't find it at the moment online. But anyway, um, I will just tell people what we've got coming up next week, and I'll come back and say goodbye to you in a second. So um, tomorrow night, no actual on-site photography tomorrow night. Tomorrow, John Colonel John Antal is coming back, rescheduled from last week to talk about Eisenhower. So going from the, from the, the story of a couple of tankers tragically killed to the leader of the whole thing tomorrow. That's, so that's kind of concluding a week later, Leadership Week. Then the 10th of June, so Thursday, uh, James Fenelon is coming on to talk about the crossing of the Rhine. So um, the 17th Airborne. So again, no live photography. Then the 11th, it's the Manil Patry Canadians. Uh, Mike Bechtold's coming on. 12th SS again. Queen's Own Rifles Academy. First Hussars. That'll be an incredible show. And then the shows just keep coming on and on and on. I think my next evening off is the 15th or something. So I've, so it's, they're coming absolutely all the time now. But I love I love doing it, as you could probably tell. Um, so don't forget, people, please. Oh, so someone's someone's done the research work for us. So um, Barber County, Alabama, according to Find yep. a Grave. So there Correct. we are. Effula. Effu, effu, eff, I don't even know how to say that. I won't. I'll get it wrong. Um, so thank you very much for finding that. Thank you. So um, don't forget, folks, please, if you aren't already, uh, subscribe to the channel. Um, don't forget to click like. Like the videos. The more likes every show gets, the more it helps with the algorithm comment not just in the live chat but after the show is done leave another comment in the main comments saying you've enjoyed it or thank you very much guys it all helps with building the channel and building the profile and getting the algorithm to recommend us to other people so all of that stuff is important please check us out on patreon as well follow neils on twitter neils is an incriminally under followed account on twitter although he didn't join that far long ago so it's fairly neutral because neils is putting some great stuff on twitter and so, well, that's it. Um, we'll bring things to end, and I will. Get, uh, someone just asked when I'll get to touring again. Uh, personally, because I we do tours for Brits and Americans, I don't know. Um, late summer, August, September. Uh, but at the moment, I'm so busy with this. This is keeping me. So I don't really need guiding right now, but I will do some guiding at some point. Um, so. Thank you, Niels. Um, again, when, when, you've, when your book is out and when it's available, let me know straight away, and we can publicize okay. it, and, and we'll go from there. So. Brilliant stuff. I will see you all tomorrow to talk about General Ice now. Thanks, Niels. Thanks, Mag. She's on her way back. I'll get dinner in a minute. I will see you all tomorrow to talk about General Ice now. Have a good evening, folks. <laughs>